Another adventure in Illinois law. Felony Scratching by Shane Radliff. Uh, written and published on May 12th of 2015. Available at libertyunderattack.com. At about 2 o'clock today, my first case as a juror ended. The verdict was guilty, and the charge was aggravated battery. The other jurors and I did not feel happy about the verdict, but the defense was quite weak, and the state had a strong case. I will provide more details on this uh, later on in this article. I was recommended by a colleague to do things in which I would stare straightism straight in the face. A couple of those things he recommended were attending a county board meeting and sitting in on a criminal court proceeding, uh, but I did not expect to serve as a juror before being able to sit in the audience section. My experience as a juror was a productive exercise, and I plan on doing more things like that in the future, only in the next instance, it will be voluntary. Today I took part in throwing a fellow citizen in a government dungeon. If you haven't uh, read or listened uh, to my preceding article in this series titled Adventures in Illinois Law, Jury Summons, I recommend you do that first. The Case I woke up at 6.45 a.m. Monday morning to begin preparing for the surely frustrating day ahead of me. I dressed myself in proper courtroom attire, grabbed my organic energy drink, and I was out the door. To get into the right mindset of nullifying the jury if needed, I did a, a couple of things. First off, I listened to Kyle Reardon's A Restoration Trilogy and listened to a speech by Larkin Rose titled Anarchy in which he goes in-depth describing the bullshit system we are encompassed by. Not quite sure if there is a better way to mentally prepare. I entered the Law and Justice Center at about 8.05 a.m. I made my way through the security station and headed up to, headed up to floor number 5. I exited the elevator and turned left, and guess who I see? Mr. Jason Daisy, the same gentleman who I asked to assist me in finding the legal citations for the punishments described in the jury summons letter, and whom I never got a response from, not surprisingly. Mr. Daisy was the one checking everyone in and getting us our name tags, so we made, a, we made contact as soon as I got there. I shook his hand and said, good to see you again, sir. Either he didn't remember me, or he pretended not to. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. At that point, I went and took a seat and waited for something interesting to begin. Sat there for probably an hour, and then the McLean County Circuit Clerk, Don Everhart, stepped up to the podium to deliver us a welcome speech. He proceeded to turn on an introductory video on courtroom procedure and serving as a juror. And of course, it was made by the monopolistic Illinois Bar British Accredited Registry Association. My god, the propaganda was seriously intense. The video started by explaining how we were doing a noble thing as a trial by jury, as a trial by jury is one of the things that, quote, makes our injustice system the best in the world. Emphasis added by author. It's kind of funny and terribly ironic. Apparently they forgot about entrapment cases, erroneous charges, overcrowding prisons thanks to the failed drug war, civil asset forfeiture, the suspension of habeas corpus in some cases, and throwing people on a government dungeon for collecting rainwater. If that is justice, then the definition must have changed without my knowledge. Apparently they must have forgotten that the majority of cases never see a trial. Most would just take the plea deal, which quite honestly would have been a better decision for the defendant in the case I was on the jury for the past couple of days. That point was made to us by the bailiffs, who said that uh, jury trials have dropped significantly in the last two years. They mentioned that they work two weeks a month on average. The next claim by the bar attorneys is that through serving as a juror, we will have a better respect for the in justice system. I call bullshit. Day one was enough to make me despise this state and their coercive methods even more. Again, emphasis added by author. It was quite interesting that the judges featured in the video explain that we cannot judge the validity of the law, only the facts of the case so we can reach a verdict. You know, it's, it's not like I expected them to admit to everyone that they can judge the validity of a law through jury nullification. It's just a little hypocritical that if we were to lie in the courtroom, we would be charged with perjury. And these corrupt bar attorneys lied to the potential jurors multiple times, and that's perfectly okay. 
And that was all about all that was interesting out of the int introductory video, so I will move forward. After it ended, I sat and waited for about another 30 minutes or so and conversed with a couple of gentlemen that were at my table. It was meaningless small talk, but I did find out that I went to high school with one of my fellow potential jurors' daughters. Finally, Mr. Daisy approached the podium and informed us that uh, they were selecting the first set of jurors. He announced seven or eight numbers, and then he called mine. I lined up at the double doors with the rest of, it, rest of them, I think there were 30-something others, and we proceeded to head into the first courtroom on the left. I saw the defendant and her attorney, and also saw the state's attorney. I took a seat with the rest of the potential jurors, and the judge addressed us. He went through his normal spiel and repeated the same lie that was stated in the video. Quote, your job isn't to determine whether the laws are good or bad. Your job is simply to hear the facts of the case and determine the guilt of the defendant. End quote. His next statement nearly, nearly made me break out in uncontrollable laughter because it was so retarded. Quote, when you were done with your jury duty and you want to change the law or get it removed, call up Illinois Representative Dan Brady and he will help you in getting the law changed or removed. End quote. So according to the judge, the proper response to an unjust law is not jury nullification, but becoming a lobbyist. For those who are unaware, lobbying is legalized bribery. After another scripted normal spiel, he informed us on the nature of the case. The charge is aggravated battery of a nurse, and it is worth a mention that he told us this before Voidier. Surely not, it's surely not one that would permit jury nullification because initiating force is mal en se, evil in itself. Voidier took place with all of the jurors, uh, not four at a time as previously stated. As far as I could tell, I didn't see any way out of it, and plus, I figured the chance was pretty small that I would get chosen. The judge asked, asked us numerous questions, and then the lawyers got their turn to ask. State's attorney uh, asked how many of us watch shows like CSI and CIS, Law and Order, etc., etc. Most everyone raised their hands, but I did not, as all of those shows just glorify law enforcement and the injustice system. His point was to inform us that those shows are unrealistic and that we shouldn't use anything we've learned in those shows as it's probably wrong. Duh. To continue, we were in there for about an hour during Voidier, and then we were asked to go out into the hall while they selected the jurors. We are out there for about 10 or so minutes, and then they called us back in. To my surprise, I was selected as a juror in this case. He then asked all of us not selected to exit the courtroom, all of those not selected to exit the courtroom, and went on to tell us that we are not allowed to do any research on the case, to avoid newspapers, radio, and television, for the remainder of the case, and that we couldn't even look up the legal citation for what the defendant is being charged for. How do they expect me, as a juror, to do my civic duty and render a judgment as to a serious matter of guilt or innocence without knowledge of the nature of the alleged crime? Isn't that the million dollar question? The judge then let us know that the trial would start at 1.30 p.m. that afternoon. It was about 11 a.m. at that time, and we were on recess until then. I went to lunch and then returned to the courthouse. I rode the elevator back up to floor 5 and went to the jury deliberation room to wait until we were called back into the courtroom. That afternoon, we heard from two Bloomington firefighters, paramedics, who first arrived to take the defendant to the hospital. We heard from the registered nurse who was taking care of the defendant and who witnessed the offense. And finally, we heard from the charge nurse, the supervisory nurse, the one whom the defendant caused bodily harm to. It was 100% clear that the defendant did cause bodily harm to the charge nurse, and that was even admitted by the defense, but the defense was going for a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. The claimed reason was that the defendant suffered from epilepsy, and that she didn't know what she was doing due to her recent seizure. The witness called by the state, uh, the four I, I mentioned above, all corroborated the story that the defendant was aware and oriented to person, place, and time. And uh, for the sake of time and, re and redundancy, I'll just summarize by saying this. The burden of proof for the aggravated battery charge was on the state, but the burden of proof for the insanity aspect was on the defense. 
As I mentioned above, the defense had a flimsy case for insanity, and plus, the defendant was caught in multiple lies while on the stand, which made us question her credibility altogether. The defense called two witnesses, one being the defendant and the other being a forensic psychologist who actually heard the defense's case. The defendant also didn't help her cause any, and I'm still confused as to why she even volunteered to, te to testify in the first place. The defense also stated that, uh, I'm guessing, since the state would have if they hadn't, the defendant had been convicted of three prior charges, including harassment of a witness and prostitution. To conclude the case, I will reiterate, the defense didn't have a case for insanity, and the state had an open and shut case for aggravated battery of a nurse. We heard the closing arguments from both attorneys, and then we were treated to the jury deliberation room. We were told our job and the procedure, and the bailiffs left us to decide the verdict. We all unanimously agreed that she was guilty of aggravated battery of a nurse. The only question left was, did the defendant have a case for insanity? We discussed for about 10 to 15 minutes about that and also some other matters related to the case, and we all agreed that the bodily harm inflicted upon the nurse was very minor. She had scratches on her, her arms and that was about it. That wasn't a highly discussed subject as the defendant seemed like she had been in similar positions before and keeps finding her way back into court. We made our decision, signed the paper, and then were called back into the courtroom. The judge read the guilty verdict and we were released from jury duty. Post-trial. I left the courthouse and started on my way back home to complete this article and also figure out and to also figure out what the defendant could possibly face. On the way home, I still couldn't morally justify throwing a fellow citizen in a government dungeon. Yeah, the defendant does have quite a history and definitely has some issues, but I still just don't like the fact that I contribute, contributed to someone's kidnapping. Although, as I mentioned before, I myself was coerced by government to serve on this jury. In addition to that, the injuries to the charge nurse were so minor, and at that time I didn't know what the defendant could potentially be facing as far as sentencing. Even before the sentencing, it only strengthened my support for private arbitration and dispute resolution. I arrived at home and first logged into uh, onto McLean County Public Access to see what the defendant had been charged with in the past. I will say she had a, a rap sheet a mile long, and that's no exaggeration either. I also looked at the potential sentencing she could be facing. Most aggravated battery charges are class 3 felonies, which hold prison time from 2 to 5 years, or 5 to 10 years, if the court finds aggravating factors. The aggravated battery charge pushed by the state in the trial was aggravated battery of a nurse, though. That part is important, and could bump up the charge to a class 1 felony, which carries sentencing of 4 to 15 years. I'm unsure as to which one they will charge her with, but since she didn't take a plea deal, she will probably not get any good deals on this one. Also, her previous charges aren't going to help her out any. I think it's also worth a mention that circumstances like this happen every single day in hospitals, and we as jurors were there to determine whether the defendant was guilty of felony scratching. There were other details shared with us regarding her violence towards other members of the hospital staff, some more severe, but we were only told to focus on the nurse. It's a common law principle that the punishment must fit the crime. And after looking at the law after the case, I have a tough time understanding how the defendant deserves years in a government dungeon for felony scratching. She's not facing days. She's not facing weeks. She's not facing months. She's facing years. It's not like our prisons are empty by any means. America actually holds 25% of the world's prison population, and the prisons are already overcrowded. In a truly free society, what the defendant would owe to the nurse in the form of restitution is the cost of any bandages as well as well as an apology not rotting away in a taxpayer funded dungeon so all in all it was definitely a learning experience certainly didn't enjoy it though i still resent the fact that i was forced to contribute to a fellow citizen being thrown in a government dungeon but something needed to be done and unfortunately since this is a system we live in there really weren't any alternatives, especially considering the potential punishments I would have faced had I chosen to civilly disobey the government. In addition to that, she did violate the non-aggression principle, and in the, moral, in, in the moral and just society I envision in the future, that would be one of the most severe things one could do to a fellow human being, because all initiatory force is immoral. 
current system we have in place now does not work on behalf of the citizenry. The system isn't broken. It's working just as it's intended to. Something needs to change, and quickly. You just heard another adventure in Illinois law, Felony Scratching, read to you by the author Shane Radliff, published on May 12, 2015, available at libertyunderattack.com.